All right, welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm really looking forward to this session. I'm looking, this session is entitled EAPS, How Times Have Changed. And with us, we have Ron Prin, the director of the Center for Global Change Science and the director of the MIT Joint Program on the Science and Policy of Global Change, the department head from 1998 to 2003. Um, John Southard, the professor, a professor emeritus and EAPS' first McVicker Fellow. Um, who also did his undergrad at MIT, perhaps the person in the room and perhaps the person in the world with the longest association with EAPS, uh, starting in 1957, I believe. Um, and Maria Zuber, uh, our current vice president for research and the department head from 2003 to 2012. And moderating the discussion is our current department head, Rob Vanderhilst. So Rob, take it away. Thank you, David. Um, is this working okay? Okay, yeah, I can't hear it from, from here. Thank you, David, and thank you very much, John and Ron, uh, Maria, to, uh, to share the stage with, with me here this afternoon. Um, so this morning I gave a very, very brief high-level overview of many things that have changed. So what has changed? And we are going to pick up on that theme um, in the next half hour or so, in the next 40 minutes, uh, hopefully with a lot of your interaction as well. Um, in the session that Fatima led this morning uh, with, with Kerry and... Um, Lindy uh, and John, we had a more kind of personal perspective what being at EAPS meant to them in terms of their careers and what were the ripple effects of that. Um, what I would like to do in the next half hour is to look more at kind of a departmental perspective. Um, so we have people here that were during the transition were here, Ron and, uh, and John, and also we have two of the subsequent leaders um, of the department, Ron and Maria. And so there's a lot of perspectives here, you know, about the department itself. Um, John, of course, was invited because you are indeed the oldest, one of the oldest um, members of the community here, starting in '57. Got that uh, way somehow. I'm not sure how. Well, we are happy that you're you're here. And so what we will do is, um, they each have say five, six minutes to tell their story, um, and then I have a few questions for each of them, um, and then we do like what we did this morning, uh, do a Q&A &A for, uh, for the audience. So think about questions to ask, uh, because that makes it very lively, and uh, we'll spend quite a bit of time on that kind of dialogue between uh, our colleagues here and, and you. So with, without further ado, John, yes. take it away. <coughs> well, as, uh, as David mentioned, <coughs> I'm pretty sure that I have the longest association with the department. I uh, was a sophomore at MIT um, in 1957. I had come to MIT to be a meteorologist because I was a weather nerd all the way through high school. And I went to MIT because they had such a good meteorology department. <clears throat> well, the year I got there, they discontinued their undergraduate program. <laughs> I was crushed. <laughs> And they told me, well, you can major in physics or geology and then do graduate work in meteorology. Well, I didn't want to be a physics major, so I signed on to course 12. And um, <clears throat> I was there until 1960. Um, so I was almost in the meteorology department. If I'd uh, been a year earlier, they would have had a program in course 19, and I would end up being a meteorologist. Now, I, I, I have enjoyed being a geologist, so I don't feel bad about that. But <clears throat> so the department then, in the 50s was much smaller than it is now. We had maybe 12 or 13 faculty, fair number of, un fair number of undergraduates, but very few graduate students or postdocs. And it was undistinguished in terms of, of excellence of earth science departments. And there was a decision made, I guess, by the administration to upgrade and expand the department. They brought in a, uh, a a special geophysicist named Frank Press from California as chairman. He turned the department around. He hired a number of people uh, over a period of three or four years, including me. Uh, I started on the faculty here in 1967. And he managed to weed out some of the, well, almost placeholders. Um, one I remember went quietly to get another job in another, another university. Another one went kicking and screaming, but he left. And one just decided to stand pat and stay here and eventually retired. So the, cha the department changed enormously in that period of time. I came back in 67 
started teaching. And um, at that time, MIT had very few women students. In my class of 1960, there might have been five or six. And we had one, one geology major in the late 50s. I remember her well. Her name was Geraldine Betchick. She married one of my classmates. And we've kept in touch for many years. <clears throat> the geology students, the geology majors, were required to take a uh, summer-long geology field course in Nova Scotia. It was quite an, quite an experience. But they would not let her attend. Their excuse was they couldn't find lodging for her. She was very put off by that. I thought at the time that was deplorable. And she still is bitter about it. And then as time went on, uh, there was a smattering more women students, not too many. But the MIT made a, a big drive in about 73, 74 to recruit more women students as undergrads. And there was a, a sharp, striking rise in the number of students. We had some in our department. I had three of them working as Europe's in my laboratory. They were very concerned that they didn't belong there because they were just chosen because they were women. And I assured them that they were just as good as anybody else in the department. And so I've watched the number of women students increase over the years to what it is now. It's still, still rising, good thing. Um, but in those days, it was very uncommon. And the first um, woman faculty that I remember was Marcia McNutt, who went on to have a distinguished career after her, her stint as a professor in our department at MIT. And then as time went on, more and more and more. So I can give you this long perspective of how MIT has changed in terms of size of our department, uh, how distinguished our department is, and how many women students and faculty we've managed to get into our department. I'll have some other things to say if we want to go on from here. I'll, I'll give you a few anecdotes that you might find amusing when, we, when the time comes, OK? Great. Thank you, Joe. OK. I guess it's my turn as the second oldest person in the room. <laughs> OK, when did I arrive at MIT? Well, in 1968, I arrived at MIT to do my doctoral degree in chemistry, which I completed in 71, and then joined the faculty of the Department of Meteorology, what was the Department of Meteorology in 1971. I didn't get a chance to be a postdoc or anything. Uh, I was just uh, giddy with, uh, is, is this the usual way? Uh, I always remember when I did join the department that I went onto the 14th floor and I had a single bay office and uh, was introduced to some of the people, well, certainly my next door neighbor with a much bigger office than I had with a personal secretary, uh, Jewel Charney. So I would see Jewel every morning, because he was my neighbor. And then I also, further down the corridor on the 14th floor, met someone else. His name was Hank Stommel, a uh, prominent, very eminent uh, oceanographer. And here I was, just a junior little guy, hired to do atmospheric chemistry as a new discipline. And I was doing it on not just Earth, but uh, in planetary atmospheres. So I would be doing studies of Venus and uh, Jupiter, their chemistry of their atmospheres. But I was doing it in the Department of Meteorology, which at least made some sense. But all of the planetary scientists were in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, which was 13th floor and below. And it made me realize a few things about Building 54. The first thing I remember about 50, Building 54 is when I arrived as, as a doctoral student from New Zealand in 68, uh, this was an impressive building, uh, an iconic building. Uh, and yes, it had a wind tunnel uh, that uh, has disappeared. I don't know where it went. <laughs> Rob, what did you do? <laughs> But, uh, and it had doors that uh, some staff members couldn't even open when the winds were blowing through the wind tunnel. Then we had revolving doors, which would start revolving by themselves in the wind. And so you had to sort of 
grab it and stop it revolving in order to get through. But anyway, I was most impressed. It was only four years old, and uh, it uh, looked beautiful. The concrete looked new, and, uh, and I had a little office on the 14th floor, so I was you know, quite happy. Then I noticed something as I tried to interact uh, in the building is that it was stratified by density of the, st of the stuff they studied. So people like John must have been on the lower floors, and the people in, in the upper, upper floors were, I was on an oceanography plus meteorology, but the o meteorology people, uh, Lorenz and, uh, and others, were on the higher floors. So we were stratified from, really, from the bottom of the building to the top of the building. And uh, despite that, there were two departments until 1983. There were two departments, but there was a lot of interaction. Uh, strange things between the departments was I was doing planetary science in the meteorology, Earth meteorology department, and Carl Wundt was doing oceanography in an Earth and planetary sciences. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, as time went on, uh, interactions occurred, uh, particularly in oceanography, for example, between the chemical oceanography, which was in Earth and planetary sciences and uh, physical oceanography, which was in the meteorology, what became the meteorology and physical oceanography department. So uh, Carl was in the, in the, in, not in the physical me, me, uh, oceanography group, uh, but uh, further down the building. So a variety of things were going on. We were interacting. Uh, the building was stratified. I always said to, said to myself, this is the worst possible building to be doing interdisciplinary science, for example, and it still is. And we all struggle with it, but uh, then uh, came the um, question of, should these two departments be merged? And it was first uh, brought up to me by a guy, John Deutsch. Uh, who some of you know. And uh, I got the feeling that John wanted to merge the departments uh, and had his reason. But anyway, he appointed, as John cleverly does, he appointed a committee of three people. So the three people were Ted Madden, who was chairing the committee, uh, who was a, a geophysicist, eminent geophysicist, uh, in, the, in the earth and planetary sciences at that time. And then Carl Wunsch, who was a physical oceanographer, not in the meteorology and physical oceanography department. And I was an atmospheric chemist doing chemistry of Earth atmosphere, which made sense in meteorology, but uh, interacting a lot with people in the planetary sciences group. Um, an entity back then that the department had, the lower floors, was the MIT Planetary Astronomy Lab, for example. And there uh, I got involved in that grouping as well, which was, again, associated with the Earth and Planetary Sciences Department. Anyway, we were to this little three-panel committee, um, made some friends and some, made some enemies as we went around. We were just advising, uh, uh, yeah, OK, how are we going? One minute, yeah, that's how I'm going to be finishing. <laughs> um, we were just advisory, and uh, the big issues that had to be faced were that some people felt that uh, their discipline would be swallowed in a, in a larger entity, and that's a legitimate uh, thing, particularly to do with attracting students and postdocs and so on. There was a group of us uh, that uh, did want to look at... Uh, merging because we were selfishly, there are, had advantages when we merged. Uh, a big overall overarching was the notion of what I call the co-evolution of, of uh, the spheres. Uh, so there was lithosphere, there was geosphere, there was cryosphere, there was hydrosphere, and there was atmosphere. If you wanted to study climate, you had to at least lo look at the oceans and atmospheres together but then you'd have to understand the, the driving force of radiative forcing of climate change is chemistry uh, uh, and biogeochemistry. And so 
uh, it led, as you know, to the merger and in 1983. A big thing at the end that made it, it the first uh, chair was uh, Bill Brace. And uh, there is still the luncheon, I still call the luncheon that we have each week, the Bill Brace lunch, and uh, because he brilliantly thought that we all had to give a speech each, at each lunch, each of us would give a talk, and uh, then time has expired. <laughs> and I always obey signs. Well, we come back uh, to each and everything that you've said anyway, so but <laughs> I want to give Maria an opportunity, and then uh, we go back to the next round. Well, sure. Um, so, first of all, I so enjoyed um, the program yesterday, and, and actually I was sitting there, um, and I was uh, thinking to myself, I mean, the issues with this building have, they didn't start when you were department head and they didn't start when I was department head and they came before you were department head to Bron. And, um, and I, but I remember when I was here to do my, um, my job talk and Tom Jordan was the uh, department head and we were going over to see um, Bob Bergino, who was the dean, okay? And, uh, and the elevator got stuck. And we, and, and we were stuck in the elevator for almost 15 minutes. And Tom said to me, when we get over to see Bob, you make sure you tell him why we're late. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, you know, then, I mean, I came here anyway. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, <laughs> I was thinking to myself yesterday, God, maybe if I had turned them down because you don't even have functioning elevators at this place, you know, <laughs> if enough people did that, maybe we would have had this renovation done before now, but some people are saying no, yeah, and you, you may be right, but, um, but when I actually, you know, after you have a building, you know, 20 to 30 years, you start planning for res renovations. Um, when I took over as department head, I found a, a drawer um, in the department head's office, and it was full of studies to renovate the green building, and, um, and that was in 2003, okay? And it was full of studies. And so I, of course, raised the issue of renovating the building with, um, with the institute leadership. And they said, well, let's do a study. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so, uh, so that's, uh, you know, that's kind of the way that, that went for a long time. And Rob, you got it across the finish line. So we're, we're uh, all vicariously celebrating um, with you. So, um, uh, you know, actually the reason that I came to this department was because it was so interdisciplinary. So I actually had graduate students who were, you know, aerospace engineers, geologists, biologists, geophysicists, oceanographers, and, and atmospheric science. So I had graduate students who covered um, all of those disciplines, okay? And... Um, and, but there were, you know, there were structural barriers that, um, that uh, I think broke down um, as we went along. So, you know, the oceans and atmospheres people would take a written test. And so it became, you know, if you had to take that written test um, and you had, you know, come through uh, the solid earth part of the department, it was hard to switch over, okay? And, um, and those, those, um, uh, it's evolved through time where it's gotten even far more um, interdisciplinary. When I came here in planetary, we, we were very, very strong in, um, in radar studies. And, uh, and in planetary, we got much more um, interdisciplinary, okay? In fact, uh, I got to tell a story about Ben Weiss, okay? So, um, so Ben, um, I rejected Ben as my graduate student twice. <laughs> Okay, so he applied, and I mean he's great on paper, right? But he, I had, I had, I had five graduate students, and uh, and I, sorry Ben, I can't take you. So he went to Harvard, hated it, reapplied, and I turned him down again, and he went to Caltech, uh, but I never forgot Ben. Okay, and um, so then we were we were doing a search for a faculty uh, candidate, and. Um, and he applied, did paleomagnetism, and there was no one on the search committee who had any interest in paleomagnetism. 
but I wanted to interview Ben, so, so I actually went to Ron, was the department head, and I said, Ron, can we add somebody to the search committee so I have enough votes to invite Ben to give a talk? And, um, and actually, when Ben came to give his talk, I was at home in bed with pneumonia, and, um, and I was sitting there, and I just started getting all these texts and emails saying, where on earth did you find this guy? And, uh, and it was all done. Um, and, um, and so, the, you know, the fact that somebody could emerge in a field that you didn't think was forefront, but the right person came in and, um, and, um, and was able to show us where the future was, you know, that's the kind of, uh, of uh, hiring that we love to do. And when I was department head, I hired um, more than a quarter of the department. And, um, and you do that, it makes a big difference, Rob. You're, you've got to be even more than that. And, um, and so I just loved the kind of people that we brought in. And the last story I'm going to tell um, before I hand it over to Rob is just uh, um, I, one of those people I hired was Lindy. Okay, and um, uh, Lindy uh, hadn't been my graduate student. She worked for Tim Grove and um, Brad Hager, but we did do uh, several studies together. And, um, and so uh, when Lindy was, um, she was, uh, you know, proposed this mission psyche, which I think she told you about this morning. And, um, and this was right after the 2016 election. And I was sitting in academic council next to Raphael Reif, who was the president at the time. And my phone goes off, and it's Lindy. And I knew that this decision was coming. So I pick up the phone, and she said, we won. You know, I went like this. <laughs> and I ran outside the door. And then I, I came back in, and Raphael said to me, did they do a recount? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I better stop there. <laughs> No, but those are great stories. And um, there's a few things that I would like to, uh, to comment on right away. One comment that you made, John, in terms of times have changed. You, you recounted the story about this, you know, women student, female student who couldn't go to Nova Scotia. Right. Well, yeah. many, the only one we had. Yeah, many, many, many decades later, not only can they, of course, go to Nova Scotia, but the trips are being led by female faculty. Right. So it's quite a change. And I'm sorry, Ron, that uh, we removed the uh, revolving doors. I know from New Zealand you like wind, but we <laughs> we blocked it all off. So it's uh, I, I think it's better for it. And yeah, I'm not complaining. Yeah, and and what Maria said is very true about uh, the anecdote about Ben. Um, you know, over the last say, 20, 25 years that I've been here, there's always been stories about you know we should make a strategic plan. And time and time again, you know, we came together to talk about strategy, and the first person that we hire has nothing to do with a strategic plan. Because they just wow us, I mean, they come to, uh, to interviews and say, hey, that is the person we need. And that's what I also mentioned this morning in terms of strategy, just going always after the best person at any point of time, really, I think, has worked very, very well for us. Before I give you an opportunity, John, to talk about some of your anecdotes, um, I would be very interested in your perspective, John and Ron, as being you know, very, very closely involved in the transition itself. You were on the committee, you said, you know, appointed by John Deutsch. Uh, you already talked about some of the motivations to do that. Um, if you look back now, what do you think uh, are the main successes? But in particular also, were there expectations and anticipations that were not materialized? Plans or for, for no, 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 from the general. merger itself. From ah, from the merger. Um, in some ways, you know, as I mentioned in my remarks, the merger was sort of happening sort of bottom up a little bit because there were these crossovers between the two departments. Uh, you can probably guess I was very strongly in favor of the merger because of my interest, but. Uh, there were a lot of successes. Uh, we were able to, you know, go into the area, for example, of geobiology, which uh, was really hands off uh, to the notion that we would be looking at anything biological. But as an atmospheric scientist, I know full well that our atmosphere, in the before humans were began messing things up, 
was controlled really by the biosphere, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, CO2, uh, and so on, uh, are all largely under the control of natural processes that, in in that involve biology. So that was certainly one of the big successes. Um, we've been s s struggling for a long time because cryosphere has been important. Uh, certainly, uh, even back when uh, the, the merger had occurred and Bill Brace was the department head, there was already a desire to find somebody to, that would be specializing in the cryosphere, which is a key part of the climate system as well, and a key um, method in, in uh, the changing of the landscape of the, of the planet, uh, of our planet over time. Uh, these massive glaciers, I come from a country of glaciers, <laughs> uh, and really appreciate uh, what they do. So there have been, and I think we're still struggling to find uh, uh, experts in the, in the cryosphere broadly defined. Um, I hate uh, trying to remember things that didn't go didn't go right. I mean, I'm having a problem. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> no, that 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 is absolutely fine. That is great. Um, but John, you wanted to to share a few well, stories from that time, maybe. Let me address the, the merger. Yeah. I was not involved in planning the merger. I was a kind of objective observer. I was all for it, and I think that most people are in our department, course twelve, are for it. But but I wonder about. The other, the other side, the other group, the people in Course 19. I remember that two or three, at least, of their more senior faculty took retirement. I don't think they were interested in the merger. And I, I'm wondering whether someone, one, one of you or someone in the audience, could address the, the, the dynamics or the personalities involved in, in the merger. Because I have the feeling that the meteorologists we're not completely in favor of it, but but I but I'm I've often wondered that I'm not sure. So if anybody wants to address that, I'll wait to make some other comments. All right. Yeah. Okay. So there's a call for the audience uh, in in a few minutes to uh, to talk about that. Uh, hold your thought, um, Carrie, because we will get back to that. Um, I also would like to ask um, in in a similar kind of vein, both Ron and and Maria and. During your times as department heads, um, of course, many things have changed. Many things have been similar, like the quest for space. Um, I think, indeed, I think the first meetings about renovation of the Green Building was from early, early 90s. So it's, uh, it's over 30 years ago, and, and now here we are. But space, of course, was probably not the only you know, issue of the time. But so what, what at, at, at your tenures, what, what were the biggest challenges uh, that you were facing with at that time, Maria. Yeah, well, the, um, actually one of the really big ones for me is, um, uh, I think what I, it was uh, tenuring somebody in oceans and atmospheres. So I, I think uh, there was a string of people that didn't get tenure and, and, um, and then, um, Actually, the last people who had been tenured uh, when I became department head had been Kerry, uh, Emmanuel, and Paula Rizzoli, who were tenured the same year. And, you know, people didn't get tenured, so, so we had difficulty attracting the top people that we wanted to get. So Raf Ferrari came up, and uh, the letters were incandescent, and... And she went to Bob Silby and I said, um, I'd like to tenure him at the associate professor without tenure. I want to, I want to skip that promotion and go right to, to tenure. And, um, and he said, well, you'll have to have a good case. And I said, I don't worry about science council. I worry about getting it through my department. So I talked to the search committee and they went, Maria, don't muck with it. He's doing fine. Just let him go. So, uh, so actually in the meeting, Everybody read the letters, and this was really good. And I said, I said, okay, I want to take a vote here. How many think he deserves the associate professor without tenure? Everybody voted. And then I said, I want to take one more vote, and that is um, I want you to vote to 
empower me to proceed as I see fit when I go to Science Council. And, um, and that vote went through. And, um, and so we were able to tenure him um, with uh, skipping a promotion. And it just made all the difference in the world. All of a sudden, we were able to attract whoever we wanted with great confidence that, that there was a, a pathway to tenure for them. So. Yeah. No, that's great. Rome. Yes, what do you want me to address? What were the, the biggest challenges you faced when in the department in terms of you know, your own role within the department or with, with the administration or were the issues very similar as they were today? Or? Yeah, they were they're similar today. Uh, when we were looking for to go into geobiology, which was when I was department head, uh, we did try to get various people to move here without naming them. Um, and uh, fortunately, after a number of tries, we were able to get somebody here who turned out to be a real leader in the field, and that's Roger Summons. And uh, uh, that was a lot of work, though, and I think you know, it was a challenge. It's, of course, uh, he's an Australian, <laughs> and I'm a New Zealander, and there was a challenge there. <laughs> Uh, each having to agree that uh, we were equally uh, uh, important or... But uh, I, I was, uh, at the end of it all, this, this, and his wife got involved in it as well, at the end of it all he did come and I can remember him coming to our house, Jane and I having a little party at our house to... Uh, and uh, met his... Met, that was when I met his wife, that... Uh, I realized that uh, we'd got a real gem uh, in the department. And geobiology went on from there with a number of faculty since then. But that first stepping stone, I think, was one that worried me that we weren't going to make it. I really did want to have a geobiology component. And uh, it took, took time. I thought it would be easier. And that's because a lot of people didn't want to move here. <laughs> uh, yeah. And Bria would have been... A, aware of some of the people that we did try. But I don't want to put names on that. No, but what you said is very true, and also that, that in a different way what you said, Maria. It's, you know, you have these tipping points and these, these very yeah. pivotal pivotal decisions that all of a sudden kind of well, you know, make things possible. It's incredible how much difference hiring the right person at the right time can be and just uh, getting everybody excited and moving everybody in the right direction, so. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, I thought I'd mention a few things that you might find, might find it amusing. Just on a personal note, when they hired me in 67, my intent was to set up a big hydraulic laboratory with big tanks and channels to study sand movement by turbulent shear flows. Um, and they cleared out most of the 10th floor on the north side for my laboratory, and we built a couple of really big tanks, a lot of welding and construction. I always figured that if I lost my job here at MIT, I could probably make a living as a welder. I did a lot of welding. But anyway, the, the, uh, the water supply was in metal tanks mounted way up in between the rafters. And it worked pretty well, except after a number of months of operation, somebody, and I think it was a maintenance person, left a valve partly open, and the water overtopped the supply tanks down the floor, down the corridor, toward the elevators. Frank Press's office was just beyond, just near the elevators, and the water happened to flow into the floor above his office, and right down onto his desk, and uh, of course he was enraged. But that uh, allowed him to find a better place for our laboratory, we moved out of building 10 into the old building 20. It was one of my little uh, <laughs> unintended advantages. But I thought I'd mention a couple of other things to give you a flavor of what things were like in the old, old days, uh, well before the, uh, before the merger, when I was a young, young assistant professor. Um, <clears throat> Frank Press was very effective in hiring and running the department. But he was, in a way, 
uh, a benign dictator. We had faculty meetings, not many, just a few every, every semester. Uh, and he basically told us what was going to be happening, and we didn't have much of a say in it. But um, in those days, they smoked cigars in faculty meetings. Can you imagine that? So uh, on one occasion, in the middle of a faculty meeting, Frank decided he had to get something from his office. I'll be right back. Anybody need anything? Erwin Shapiro pipes up and says, could you bring a gas mask? <laughs> of course, he didn't, but there you go. Frank, ha Frank and his wife, Billy, had a, a, an enormous house in Belmont. And every year, he had a major department faculty dinner. At that time, we had 20-some faculty, and most of them were married. No women faculty. Maybe Marsha McNutt was on the faculty then. I can't remember. And after dinner, the men would go into a room off the dining room, smoke cigars and drink brandy. And the women went into another room. It's like the dark ages. <laughs> but that's what the department was like. Almost no women, uh, a dictatorial <laughs> uh, department chairman. But well, we lived through it. Those times indeed have changed, uh, <laughs> fortunately. We have only a few minutes left, and I do want to give uh, people in the audience an opportunity to ask questions. Maybe we have time for uh, one or maybe two questions, and then if there's answers, keep them brief. Any questions or Anke? Very quickly, so Maria, you mentioned that it can make a key difference if the right person is hired at the right time. Was there ever a situation when you were glad that the right person left at the right time? Uh, yeah, addition by subtraction, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there, you know, there were, there, um, there were uh, a couple that left um, without retention packages, so. Um, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, no. I mean, it it uh, it was it, you know it was never science. I mean, the you know everybody's science was top rate. It was um, you know it was it was more a situation as you know are people great colleagues. Um, you know people don't have to collaborate and write papers with with everybody, but. Um, but are they collegial, and does everybody lift everybody's lift everybody up just because of the interactions they have and the questions that they ask? Um, that um, you know, I I, uh, I actually when I was department head, I, I think I was the first one to introduce the idea of you had to ask about collegiality on hiring and promotion letters, and it wasn't that it was like the only factor, but it was a factor, and, and I actually got invited all over the institute to talk about the concept of considering collegiality in hiring and promotion. So now it's an automatic, so. Kerry, can I put you on the spot and answer the question that John raised? At the time of the merger, um, you know, clearly we are here and celebrating the merger, but things may not have worked for everybody. I mean, there were the people at that time that were not happy with it, and, and what did they do? So I, the, the important point I wanted to make, Rob, that just as a factual background, is that a few years earlier, the Department of Meteorology at University of Chicago, which has very, very high reputation, merged with the geophysicist, and that was a failure by everybody's reckoning, a pretty bad one. Now, of course, it may have been that good people were gonna retire or leave anyway, and maybe people were putting two and two together and getting five, but that was the perception, and the perception was important because it affected our ability to get good graduate students and good future faculty, and we were terrified that that would happen to us. So most of the young faculty, and I have to admit, I was very strongly opposed to the merger. That was the driving force of that. Looking back at it, I'm glad we did it. But at the time, a lot of us were opposed. Yeah. Interesting perspective. I, I did not know that. Time has expired. So we 
transition to uh, to a coffee break, uh, but I want to thank Maria and Ron and John very much for sharing your perspective on this. Uh, I realize, you know, we could have spent the next hour talking about things and reminisce about, you know, stories and anecdotes. Uh, maybe we can do that over the break um, or tonight. Of course, we have the reception. So if you have stories to share with uh, with the three of us, of course, with everybody, please do so at those moments. Thank you very much. <laughs>